So we're at the end of our faithful message series. Uh, we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians and, and studying what that has to say to us. And last week I ended on a bit of a cliffhanger. So we want to pick that up this week. And if you missed the first half, uh, it's available on our website. The video is available. I'd recommend watching that. This week will make more sense in light of last week. But basically, Paul just ends this letter to the church in Ephesus um, by giving some practical instruction about what we call spiritual warfare. I don't think they called it that back then, but um, it is a, a warfare metaphor when we're dealing with the devil. So last week, we looked at this from three different perspectives. We talked about who, what, and how. The who was, who are we fighting? the devil and his demons and, and kind of some of the characteristics of those guys. And then we looked at the what, what we're up against, some of the actual schemes that the enemy uses to deceive us and lead us astray. And then we just briefly touched on the how, um, and that's what we're going to look at this week. Uh, how do we fight the battle? So we're picking up with chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, and Leilani's going to come and read. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Thank you. Father, we ask your blessing on your word as we open our hearts to it. Pray that your spirit would translate these words for us, God, that you would draw us, that you'd have your way this morning in us and through us, in Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we really talked about the problem, and this week, we're looking at the solution, which is simply put on the full armor of God. That's what we're going to focus on. But before we go into the detail about the armor, I just want to point out one thing here that it says, it doesn't say if the day of evil comes. Do you notice that? It says when the day of evil comes. Because all of us, everybody, whether you believe in God or the devil or not, everyone is going to experience spiritual warfare in their life. That's just the facts of life. Um, and if you're a believer, there is a possibility that you'll be able to know how to deal with it when it comes. If you're not a believer, then you're kind of in trouble because you, don't, you, don't, you can't learn how to fight an enemy that you don't believe is there. That's like a blind person fighting a professional MMA fighter. You know, it's just not going to go well for them. But once you do believe, um, you can learn how to use the tools, the weapons, the armor that God provides. And, and uh, that's exactly what we're looking at this morning. It's how to use uh, the spiritual armor. So this is kind of a self-defense class, nice. spiritual self-defense class, all right? So here are the... Uh, List. This is the list of armor that um, Leilani just read. I kind of broke it out just so it's easy to look at. The belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, boots of the gospel, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. Now, I'm just going to spend a little time unpacking each of those and what's the significance of those. What, what did that mean to them that, that were familiar with Roman armament? and, and what, what uh, spiritual truths are wrapped up in there. So the first one is belt of truth. Now, remember what I said last week, that, that the enemy is the father of lies, that, that when he lies, he's speaking his native tongue? Well, what better way 
to combat an enemy whose very weapons are lies than with the truth, right? So the belt of truth is really important, and I, I don't think it's an accident that Paul mentions this one first, because truth, uh, just like the, the Roman military belt, um, that's the thing that holds all the rest of the stuff in place. Do you know what I mean by that? And, and metaphorically, you know, like for Paul, what good is it for him to provide instruction if the people that he's instructing don't believe that truth even exists? And unfortunately, that's the condition that a lot of our culture, a lot of the world, frankly, is in right now. They don't believe truth is a real substantial thing. And like I said last week, people try to bend the truth around themselves rather than trying to conform to the truth. You know, and this was true in Jesus' day too. Not, not the same way as it is today, but it was true. And there's a great example of this in the book of John. Do you guys remember when uh, the Jewish leaders uh, were really upset with Jesus because of some of the things that he said? and they wanted to execute him. So in order to do that, they had to bring him to the Roman governor, a guy named Pilate. And so they brought Jesus to this guy, and, uh, and he's like, you know, what do you want me to do with this guy? And he's like, judge him yourselves. And they're like, well, we can't because, you know, he deserves execution and only you can do that. So Pilate's like, okay, let me talk to him. And the accusation that they made was that Jesus was saying he was a king. So Jesus like, okay. I mean, Pilate's like, okay, we, we need to talk to this guy. Jesus comes to him and he says, uh, they're, they're saying that you are claiming to be a king. Are you a king? And Jesus' reply was, my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate's like, well, but you are a king then? And Jesus' response was, the reason I was born the reason I came into this world was to testify to the truth. The truth. So Pilate's response to Jesus' claim to the truth was, what is truth? He said, what is truth? Now let me paint a little background for this. Remember, philosophy was a big deal in Ephesus it was a big deal in the entire Greco-Roman, the Roman Greco, <laughs> the Greco-Roman world. And um, one philosopher would come and he would make these truth claims. You know, I, I have the truth. They would spell out this intricate philosophical view and everybody would go, wow, that's, that's an amazing truth. We've discovered the truth. And then, and then the next guy would come and he would decimate the first guy and say, oh no, there's the truth. Okay, so do you see this? This is Pilate's state. That, that happened for about 400 years. Socrates, then Plato, then Aristotle, on and on and on up until the time of Jesus. So this is the setting for Pilate's comment. He says, what is truth? He's cynical about it. And that's the state that we find ourselves in today. People are cynical about claims to truth. I was talking to a guy about God and just sharing my faith with him. And um, his response to me was, well, that's your truth, but that's not my truth. So obviously I said to him, well, truth is truth. I'm, I'm not saying this is my opinion. I'm saying this is the truth. And so this resulted in a kind of a lengthy debate between he and I. It was cordial. It was friendly. He was my friend, is my friend, um, and, but he's not a believer. And so we were debating this, and the debate, kind, the debate kind of wrapped up as I said to him, you know, truth actually has to exist. Because if you say there is no truth, then the statement, there is no truth, can't be true. 
If you say there is no truth, then there is no truth cannot be true, therefore truth must exist. You following that? Truth has to exist. It's self-refuting to say there is no truth. So, if we're going to learn how to fight this spiritual battle that we're talking about, we have to start with the belt of truth. We have to acknowledge that truth exists and that God is the source of all truth. Jesus didn't say, I know the way, I know the truth. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So God is the source of all truth. He is the truth. So that's the belt of truth. Let's look at the breastplate of righteousness now. Um, you know, when I was studying the armor, the Roman armor, which that's what Paul was referring to here, that's what people would have understood him to be describing, um, the, the breastplate of right, righteousness, it, it, the, the word that sometimes the, they use, the Greek word, literally meant heart protector. The breastplate of righteousness is a heart protector. That's a great word picture. You'll see why in a second. It's also significant that um, the breastplate uh, was connected to the belt because righteousness is connected to truth. Now, the word righteousness here, we have to understand what that means, right? He's not talking about right standing before God here. He's not talking about our justification. He's talking about our behavior. He's talking about right behavior here. Our behavior needs to be rightly connected to the truth. And Jesus is the truth. What Paul said earlier in the letter, he said, we need to live a life worthy of the calling we've received. Okay, here's how it's explained in 1 John. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and we do what pleases him. So maybe you remember last week I, I said that all people um, have this built-in, inescapable moral compass. It's like, even if you don't believe in God, you know when you're not right, when you're doing wrong. And that's, that's in Scripture all over the place, especially in Romans, Romans 7, different places. We know, in Galatians, different places. Um, so, you see, when we don't behave right, when our actions don't reflect our faith, then our own hearts condemn us. Our own hearts condemn us. Now, on the flip side, when we keep his commands and, and do what pleases him, that protects our heart. Not only that, Apparently, it makes our prayers more effective because it says here that when we do that, we receive from God anything we ask when our hearts don't condemn us. So the breastplate of righteousness, the, the breastplate of our behavior protects our heart. Then there's the boots of the gospel. Now, I call it the boots of the gospel. Actually, what he says, though, is your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the, the gospel of peace. I say boots because that's what the Roman soldiers wore. They wore these, like, big leather sandal type of things that went up their ankles and um, were kind of open. But there's something cool I noticed about this. Uh, did you notice this was the only one of all the parts of the armor that he didn't specifically name. Like the other ones, he, he named them what the, the Roman armor was. So he said the belt, the breastplate, the shield, the helmet, the sword. But here he just says, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. He doesn't name, you know why he does that? 
Do you know? I don't either. I was just wondering if you guys did. <laughs> anyway, to understand this part of the armor, there's a couple things we need to unpack. So what is the gospel of peace? You probably know the gospel just means a good message or the good news, we often say. Um, and here, obviously, he's referring to the good news that Jesus defeated sin and death, the, the bane of our existence. Jesus defeated that by living a perfect life, sacrificing himself, and then coming back from the dead after he was executed. He overcame sin. He overcame death. Because of that, he overcame it for us. That's good news, right? I mean, that's the best news ever. But why the gospel of peace? Why does he use the word peace? You know, it's really interesting that he chose that word to describe a piece of clothing that was intended for war. Peace. Peace literally means not at war. It means, you know, being in harmony. It's safety. It's prosperity. So when you consider all that, what's the message of this verse? Well, it's saying that when you believe the good news that, that we can never be separated from God because of what Jesus did, when you believe that, that results in readiness for the battle. Do you see it? We're ready for battle because we know, think about it, if you knew for sure that you, you would never cease to exist, you believe the good news that you are never going to cease to exist, you would have no fear of any kind of battle, would you? You would be ready. And you would be ready to share that good news. That's why Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can harm the body but can't get to your soul. Be afraid of the one who can kill the soul and the body in hell. So this is the good news of peace because the war that we're fighting here has no access to our eternal home. Revelation 21 says that he's going to wipe away all our tears. There will be no more crying, no more mourning, and no more pain. Can you even fathom that? No more pain of any kind, emotional, physical, Nothing. Then there's the shield of faith. So picture this. In, in the Roman armament, if you have a shield, what's the first thing that your enemy is going to come in contact with? The shield. It's the same way with our faith. Our faith is the first thing that the enemy comes in contact with when he engages us. And, you know, it's almost impossible to overemphasize the importance of our faith. Hebrews 11.6 says that it's impossible to please God without faith. Ephesians 2.8, we're justified through faith. 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, it's one of the greatest gifts available to us. Romans 5.2, it gives us access to real hope. I could go on and on, but here, faith is the shield that is the first thing the enemy contacts. So what exactly is faith? Well, according to the author of Hebrews, he says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So if I was to literally translate the word faith, the Greek word is pistis. It just means belief in something. It means believe. But 
Biblical faith is more than just believing. It's more substantial than that. See, it says now faith is confidence. That word confidence, the root word of that is foundation. It's a strong undergirding. So faith is a substantial belief in something. It's a firm foundation for belief in something. Obviously here, it's a firm, substantial belief in God. So how does this kind of faith extinguish those flaming arrows that come at us? We'll talk about what those are in a second. But how does the shield stop those? Well, you know, in, in, in Rome, what they did was they would layer the shield with leather and canvas, and then before they went into battle, they would soak it in water so that when the arrows hit the shield, it would put the fire out, and then they would just take their sword, they would cut the arrows off, and they would keep going, right? So think about this in, in the context of the spiritual metaphor. What are, the, what are the arrows that the enemy fires at us? Temptation? and accusation in many, many, many different forms, but you can kind of boil it down to that. It's temptation and accusation. Well, how does this shield of faith extinguish those arrows? Let's talk about temptation first. When we give in to temptation, we do it because we believe that what that temptation is offering us is better than what God promised. Even if you don't realize that, why would you give in to a temptation if you didn't think it was something good? In fact, something in your mind, we'll get to the mind in a second, something in your mind thinks that it's better than what God is promising you. So faith is a shield against those because it's a substantial belief that the promises of God are true and they're better. They're true and they're better. Even though they're not right there in front of us. You know, God's promises. This, this, so temptation is different. It's, it's usually something that's like right there. You know, it's like, Mm, look at this. You want some? You should try it. Come on. It's good. It's always right there. And a side note, it's like the more we give in to temptation, the more simplistic those temptations have to be because we're just weaker and weaker. But God's promises, they're not like temptation. They're not right there trying to, it's not a carrot trying to lead you on. That's why it says here, and the assurance about what we do not see. Because oftentimes we don't see God's promise dangling in front of us so we can chase it. So does that make sense? That's how faith extinguishes the arrow of temptation. It's a solid, firm belief that the promises of God are true, even if we don't see them. And then, what about the arrow of accusation? How does it work? Well, it's similar, but like, what's the promise when the devil says, you know, oh, you've really blown it this time. God's not going to forgive you. You're, you're never going to be able to escape the consequences of that. You're such a dirtbag. You're a sinner. You're a, you know, accusations. How does faith put that out? Well, we pull on the promise that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, we go right back to the promises of God. And, it, and it, faith in God, faith in his promises, extinguishes that arrow. How about the helmet of salvation? Now, if the breastplate protects our heart, what does the helmet protect? Our head, but... Our, our head, because our brain is in there, right? At least for most of us. 
You see, our mind is where our thoughts happen. And our thoughts, whether they're conscious or subconscious, direct our actions. Our thoughts direct our actions. And because of that, this is a prime target for the enemy. Why? Because just like in real battle, if you get a shot to the head, the fight is over. If the enemy can take your head, he's got everything. That's why the helmet is so important. This is the executive center of our body. This is what motivates our actions. So he attacks the mind. With what? Thoughts. What kind of thoughts? Temptations and accusations. Temptations and accusations. Because this is where those are processed. This is where they either take hold of us or we overcome them. It's a battle of the mind. So the helmet is critical. Now, how is salvation our helmet? Knowing here that God is your savior protects your mind. Knowing the good news Understanding the gospel protects our thoughts. We kind of just looked at that. Those temptations and accusations, they're meant to knock you off of your firm foundation. But Paul says, stand firm then. Look at what he wrote earlier in chapter 2 of Ephesians. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Knowing that, I mean really substantially knowing and believing that protects your mind from the attacks of the enemy. Next, the sword of the Spirit. Now, This one's unique because not only can you use this as a defensive weapon, you know, you can knock away the attacks of the enemy with the word, but this one can also be used as an offensive weapon. It's a good example of this uh, in the temptation of Jesus. I'm guessing you all remember that story. Now, because Jesus was fully God and fully man, and because his mission was to come to earth, defeat uh, sin, defeat death, overcome death, how do you overcome death? By coming back to life after they killed him. He defeated death, not only for himself, but once and for all. How did he defeat sin? Well, in order to defeat sin, Jesus had to be tempted. He had to be tempted. So he was actually, now listen, the temptation of Jesus wasn't like, remember I said, the more you give in to temptation, the more simplistic that temptation has to be. Jesus never gave in, (laughs) not even once. So the temptations the enemy had to concoct for him were complex. They were customized for someone who never sinned. And there's a lot in these temptations. So the first one, Jesus was led into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted, right? So he gets out there and he fasts for 40 days. Can you imagine? I've done 30 and it's, Brutal. (laughs) And I was drinking stuff, you know, not just water. Thought it was going to kill me. I don't know how he did it, but he did. So what was the enemy's first temptation? To get him to break his fast before the temptations began. It was the first temptation. Wanted him to break his fast. He said, turn these stones into bread. 
What was Jesus' response? Shh, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was a metaphorical sword that he pulled out and deflected that attack of the enemy. So the devil goes, okay, I see what you're doing there. Tempts him again. This time he takes him to the top of the temple and he tells him, throw yourself down because it is written. He'll give his angels charge over you. Do you see what he did there? The devil knows the word. The devil used the word against Jesus. He will use the word against you. But again, Jesus pulled the sword out and said, it's also written, don't test God. So then he tests him a third time, tempts him a third time. He takes him even higher so that he could see all the kingdoms of the world. He goes right for his purpose in life. He says, see all these kingdoms? He said, bow down and worship me and I'll give them all to you. Once again, Jesus said, it is written, worship the Lord and serve him only. And then the devil went away. I'm not going to get this guy. Okay, now there's a lot of stuff kind of built into this. I'm looking at the time. We don't have time to analyze it, much of it, but there is one thing I really have to say. All three of these temptations for Jesus were aimed at God's purpose, uh, Jesus' identity in God. You see that? They directly challenged what God said to Jesus and what God said about Jesus. That's exactly what he'll do to you. He will go after your identity, who God said you are in him. And you guys, that's why we need the word. That's why we need the word. We need to know what God said about us. And then we need to stand firm in it. So please hear me. Read your Bible. Read it. Memorize it. Meditate on the passages that were given to you to defend against the customized temptations and accusations that you experience. That's the word. That's the sword of the Spirit. It has to be in you. Jesus wasn't lugging around a bunch of scrolls and he opened them up when the devil attacked him, right? Where was the word? It was written on his heart. We need to know the word. It needs to be written on our hearts. Because when the day of evil comes, not if, when that day comes, you don't want to be caught defenseless. We need the full armor of God. So that wraps up our whole series on Ephesians. I hope you found this journey fruitful and helpful for you. Next week, we're going to start a short series um, that's going to lead us right up to the Christmas season. And this one's going to be about hearing God, hearing God's voice. Because you know what? A lot of people will struggle with how you hear God. Or even if that's a thing, can you really hear God? Does that happen anymore? Listen, it does. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. They recognize my voice. We can learn to recognize God's voice. I know a lot of people who 
don't think they hear God. Good, godly people who don't think they can hear God. And I'm going, yeah, you do. (laughs) But it's not only important that we hear God, it's important that we know we're hearing God, right? So we're going to cover all of that. Please don't miss this series. So important, so critical to our walk with Jesus. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Ephesians, this letter that was written so long ago that's so appropriate to us now. We take it in. We make it a part of our lives. Lord, as we have the word in us, give us the spirit because that three-stranded cord, us, the word, and the spirit are not easily broken. In Jesus' name, amen.